I returned from the city about three o'clock on that May afternoon, pretty much disgusted with life. I had been three months in the old country and was fed up with it. If anyone had told me a year ago that I would have been feeling like that, I should have laughed at him. But there was the fact. The weather made me liverish. The talk of the average Englishman made me sick. I couldn't get enough exercise and the amusements of London seemed as flat as soda water that had been standing in the sun. Richard Hannay, I kept telling myself, you've got into the wrong ditch, my friend, and you'd better climb out of it. Thus begins The 39 Steps by John Buchan, the novelist and much else besides. It can claim to be the best known thriller of all time. And it also inaugurates a new podcast venture, John Buchan Unbound, exploring his life and times. John Buchan was my grandfather. I'm Ursula Buchan and his most recent biographer. My book, Beyond the 39 Steps, was published in 2019 and is available, as they say, in all good bookshops. And I'm Michael Redley, a historian interested in Britain and Europe in the 20th century. Ursula and I first met when I was her teacher at university. Very long time ago. <laughs> Very long time ago. We both belong to the John Buchan Society, which is the sponsor of these podcasts. And we've decided to begin the venture by jointly exploring in a series of episodes, the part that John Buchan played in the First World War and in its aftermath. And we'll be doing this through his wartime novels and reminiscences, starting with, you've guessed it, The 39 Steps. It really was a seminal book, inaugurating a new type of dramatic story with the underworld of espionage as its setting. This was confirmed in the sequels, all of them with the same hero, Greenmantle, Mr. Stamfast, and the three hostages. And that hero is Richard Hannay, surely the best known and most loved of John Buchan's fictional characters. The Richard Hannay novels was how I got hooked on John Buchan after I was given his complete adventures as a teenager. The idea of following an interesting character, the narrator who's surrounded by a varied and growing group of friends through a series of wild adventures seemed very appealing to me. Certainly, I gobbled them up. And we'll be introducing them one by one so that by the end of it, you'll have your own collection of Richard Hannay's. Yes, they, they, I mean, they're really great stories, all of them. But for a particular reason that we'll come on to, they also tell us a great deal, don't they, Michael, about important aspects of the war. Indeed, I'm, they do. Indeed I'm thinking, for do. example, I don't know what you think, but what British people felt about their enemies was one thing. And the, the way patriotism survived despite the horrors of industrialised warfare and the preoccupation with trying to get isolationist America involved in the war. And as a sequence, of course, they also tell us about simply about how the war progressed. Yeah, yeah. With Buchan, you're right under the skin of the war in a way that's really difficult for us to do more than 100 years after it ended. Right. So to the 39 steps itself. But not everybody listening will have heard of John Buchan. So perhaps we should start with something about him. What was he like? Well, we have the biographer here with us. So, Ursula, tell us, what was he like? He was a very clever boy who grew up in modest circumstances in Scotland in the late 19th century. He was the eldest child of a free church minister and spent his teens in Glasgow, where his father ministered to a congregation in the Gorbals, which was then one of the worst slums in Europe. While at Glasgow University, he won a scholarship to Oxford, and there he made many influential friends, but he never lost his attachment to Scotland, to his family, and to his faith. He'd begun writing for publication even before he went to Oxford, and he continued while he was there. And he went to South Africa for a couple of years at the turn of the century, working as an assistant to Lord Milner, the High Commissioner, on the reconstruction of the country after the Boer War. On his return, he married into an English aristocratic family, the Groveners. He gave up the bar for a steadier income as a partner in a progressive Scottish publishing firm called Thomas Nelson and Sons. He wrote his novels and non-fiction in his spare time, and he took an increasing interest in politics, first standing as a conservative and unionist in Scotland in 1912. 
But none of this really explains why an obscure Scottish provincial, a son of the manse, without money or influence in his early life, could have significant things to say about the First World War. I think just to pick out a few particular features of it from his that busy early career you've been describing, I think you see Buchan moving rapidly into a new and different world. Take his particular role at Thomas Nelson. It was a printing as well as a publishing firm, and his job was to win new business for the firm, which he did based in its London office. And this brought him into the heart of what was then a very dynamic Edwardian media industry, where he got to know its personalities, newspaper proprietors, publishers, and leading pundits and writers. He really was in a swim, wasn't it? It's extraordinary how a- how he absolutely. moved into this world. Yes, and, and there are all sorts of connections he made with men like Northcliffe and so on, well before the war, uh, which were to stand him in good stead as he moved into the role that we'll come on to describe. And then there was his politics. His conservatism seemed quirky in a world dominated, particularly in Scotland, by liberalism. But as the public demand grew for activist intervention to organise Britain so that it could actually win the war, Buchan found himself in the heart of the action. He joined senior conservatives when they joined with the Liberals in a coalition government, joining the information department of the Foreign Office in 1915. And then there was his work in South Africa. Yeah, that's very, I think that's very really important, important, isn't it? Very, yeah. very important. Which impressed senior figures in high places, what he what he'd achieved, what he'd done. Lord Milner was one of the great weather makers of pre-war British politics, who understood better than anyone the power and significance of the press in shaping opinion. And Buchan had been very involved with Milner in South Africa and He stayed close to him politically and personally after he returned from from South Africa. Yeah, I mean, uh, John Buchan was loyal to him through thick and thin, wasn't he, as a result? He described him once as my chief. And when Milner joined the war cabinet at the end of 1916, Buchan came with him into the heart of Whitehall to establish and run the world's first Department of Information. Yeah, of course, none of this would have counted for much had he not been extremely personable, a fantastically hard worker, a great networker, a capable administrator, though not quite as good as he thought he was, <laughs> and a supremely talented writer. I couldn't agree more. I, I think all those factors make a package, really. Yeah. Talent and experience together, giving him a kind of van- vantage point from which to see from the inside the image presented of the war, but also the war itself. Yeah. And but, but and of course, what could not be said in communiques and official pronouncements could still be said in fiction. Yes. Which, as far as I know, wasn't censored. That's that's so. This is the importance of Buchan's wartime novels, really. They're fiction, but with a really strong underpinning of reality. Yes. And, and let, let's look at specifically at, 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 the, at the book a bit now is set amid conflicts between the Liberal Party with its strong laissez faire tradition and the Conservative Party keen to harness the power of the state to government. The parties were also divided in their approach to the rising power of Germany, the Liberal leaders believing that a European war was simply unthinkable. This despite a real rise in international tensions and increasing public anxiety about Germany's intentions expressed in popular novels like Erskine Childers' Riddle of the Sands about a German plot to invade England. Yes, the, the public were really quite hyped up about all of this, weren't they? And it's brilliantly yeah. captured in The 39 Steps. When he's on the run from both police and German spies, Richard Hannay, a South African of Scottish descent, falls in with a Liberal candidate on his way to a political meeting in a rural constituency. The candidate has lost his supporting speaker, who, as it happens, is a man from the colonies. So he co opts Hannay who has no knowledge of British politics, to speak for him instead. Very funny, yes. Hane has to sit there awaiting his turn and listening to the man he's supposedly supporting. And this is what he says. It was the most appalling rot. He talked about the German menace and said it was all a Tory invention to cheat the poor of their rights and keep back the great flood of social reform. 
but that organised labour realised this and laughed the Tories to scorn. He was all for reducing our navy as a proof of our good faith and then sending Germany an ultimatum, telling her to do the same or we would knock her into a cocked hat. He said that but for the Tories, Germany and Britain would be fellow workers in peace and reform. I thought of the little black book in my pocket. A giddy lot Scudder's friends cared for peace and reform. It's very, very funny. Buchan was was really keen to get the book out quickly, fearing that the public interest in spies would pass and something else would take its place. And at a meeting with his publisher, they brainstormed possible titles which could connect the book with public concerns about the war. Nothing came to mind. So, as a second best, they settled on a specific detail of the plot, The 39 Steps. But the book was, in any case, Buchan's expression of the public mood of the start of the war. Take a break from your detective work, Buchan fans because we've got something exciting to share with you. John Buchan was an important figure in the first half of the 20th century, a well-connected politician and statesman, an admired historian, as well as an incredibly successful novelist. If this podcast makes you want to know more, the John Buchan Society, which supports John Buchan Unbound, is inviting you to join the great adventure. The Society has been pioneering the study of John Buchan for more than 40 years, hosting friendly and lively meetings and seminars, and producing a journal reporting research into the many different aspects of this diverse, amazing man. And if you happen to find yourself dramatically hanging out of a train and passing peebles in Scotland, check out the John Buchan Story Museum, where you can find everything you would want to learn about the man and his books. So, to hear more about the Society and join in the adventure, visit www johnbuckensociety.co.uk and become part of Buckens story yourself. Now, let's get back to the action. So, let's get back to Scudder from the extract read just before the break. It's time we told you who he is. The 39 Steps is a wonderful thriller, in some ways the archetype of the genre and the progenitor of all that came after. And we hope you read it if you haven't already. Obviously, we we don't want to give the whole game away, but we do need to explain something of its plot. And Scudder, although he comes to a sticky end early on, is an important figure in it. Yes, and an important preliminary point, I think, is that everyone thinks they know the story of the 39 Steps. That's so true, yes. But that's not necessarily so. It was made into three films, most famously by Alfred Hitchcock in 1935. There was a film for television and a stage show, even a stage show based on the Hitchcock film. Certainly, there are lots and lots of ways you might have you might have come across the plot. But the thing is, in Buchan's version, Hannay is not handcuffed to the beautiful Madeleine Carroll as he is in the Hitchcock film. In fact, there's no love interest in the story at all, nor does he end up hanging off the clock face of Big Ben, as in the Robert Powell version. And none of these imitations is completely faithful to the book, and some are way off, and they're all very much of their time, and they honestly mainly serve to confuse the issue. Yeah, they certainly do. But anyway, back to the book. Buchan began it while taking a break from London with his wife and two children, They went to Broadstairs on the coast of Kent, which looks across the English Channel to the continent, of course. Broadstairs and North Foreland become Bradgate in the book, which is also where the climax of the novel takes place. He wrote the book in the first weeks of the war between August and November 1914. He was mostly stuck in bed with acute gastric pain, probably from a duodenal ulcer, which of course made him unfit for military service. And it may have been no more than a coincidence that there were in those days 39 wooden steps down to the beach below a clifftop villa in which some of his relatives were staying. Whoa, that's interesting. <laughs> he was also yeah. 39 years old that August, which ah, I think is, is yeah. indicative. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes. We began this episode 
with Hannay's description of his own mood at the start of the story. You'll remember that. And he is profoundly bored, you'll remember. But that quickly changes. He's forced to go on the run when Franklin Scudder, a scared American freelance spy who's appealed to Hannay for sanctuary, is murdered in his flat. The police believe he's the murderer, and the German conspirators, the Blackstone, suspect rightly that Hannay has a little notebook full of encrypted jottings passed on to him by Scudder before he died. The jottings reveal their plot to steal the British home fleet's mobilisation secrets. So there you have it. That's about as far into the plot as we're going to go. Yeah, quite. But always with Buchan, there's a deeper meaning to his fiction, isn't there, Michael? It can always be appreciated on more than one level. To understand him at all, you have to grasp that he had a lifelong preoccupation with the cosmic battle between good and evil, mainly as the result of his upbringing as a Scottish Presbyterian. Yes. Something he wrote in an earlier thriller, The Powerhouse, shows what he thought about the thinness of the crust on which civilization rests and saw in the forces seeking to destroy it, including Prussianism and the cult of the Kaiser, the embodiment of evil. If you remember, the highly civilized but wicked villain tells the narrator, Edward Leithen, you think that a wall as solid as the earth separates civilization from barbarism. I tell you, the division is a thread a sheet of glass, a touch here, a push there, and you bring back the reign of Saturn. It's, <laughs> this, <that's one> <laughs> it's this idea of the frailty of it conveyed by the sheet of glass, this yeah. thing that yeah, can, sh- can shatter at a touch. And actually, in a very early short story, he also mentions very much the same thing. So it was obviously a preoccupation with him. Yep. He had this consciousness all his life, really, and the sense of it permeates the 39 Step story as the world drifts into war. But it's interesting, don't you think, how little of Buchan there is in the character of Richard Hannay. In fact, they are in many ways opposites. Yeah, I I couldn't agree more. (laughs) Hannay is an uncultured rough diamond who often thinks and talks in platitudes and isn't much bothered about other people's sensitivities. But he's also brave, tenacious and resourceful. He's patriotic, even though he's a Scotsman who's travelled in South Africa most of his life, good at assuming identities and personalities, brighter than he thinks he is, and shy but respectful of women. Buchan knew he would appeal, as he certainly did, to judge from sales and the fan mail he received and so on, to the men who were by then, by the time the book was published in October 1915, stuck in trenches on the Western Front. Yes, he used to he used to get letters from serving soldiers, didn't he? Saying saying how much they'd enjoyed the thirty nine steps. He, he, he did, he did, and he he kept he kept some of them. And yeah, was, was obviously very very pleased with that 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 aspect of the novel. But but wouldn't you agree, Michael, that there's a very knowing air about the novel? Its sense of international politics at the time, for example, and Buchan's apparent familiarity with ciphers, intelligence work, and spying, but also a conviction that the world is moved towards war by the deliberate acts of governments. In the 39 Steps, it's not the assassination of the Archduke Ferdinand in Sarajevo, but the murder of the fictional Greek premier Karolides, which lights the conflagration. Not exactly accurate, but not far off. Indeed. And and as we'll see later in our series, this knowingness is easier to explain for Buchan's novels after he became an insider. But on what knowledge would he have based the 39 Steps? Well, he was very plugged into contemporary politics and, as I said earlier, to the media world. Many manuscripts floated through his office, uh, the, the, the Thomas Nelson office in London, written by serving officers and so on. Partly because of his society marriage, Buchan associated with leading political figures. The Foreign Secretary, for example, in the Liberal government, Sir Edward Grey, was a friend. Yeah, he always had a lot of Liberal friends. Indeed. And Lord Milner, of course, who who we mentioned earlier. During his two years in South Africa as Milner's private secretary, Buckham was privy to military intelligence and he knew the people who produced it, including Edmund Ironside, later a field marshal, on whom he said 
that Richard Hannay was partially based. I, I think probably it can only ever have been partially based. I mean, Indeed, um, yes. I mean, Hannay in some ways is the, is the average man, which Field Marshal Edmund Ironside absolutely wasn't. Well, certainly wasn't. Although reading about him, you, you, you find what an oddball he was, how unlike the average serving military officer he was in, in, in real life. And encryption, which you mentioned earlier, had been extensively used by both sides during the South African War because the telegraph was so easily tapped. Yeah, and, of course. And it was vital to maintain communications on a secure basis. Certainly. It's interesting to me, the attempted theft of information about Britain's naval dispositions Mm. It, it's not so important in itself, is it? But what what I think makes it significant is the fact that war has been deliberately and successfully provoked at the same time by the Black Stone. As Hanny puts it, while we were talking about the goodwill and good intentions of Germany, our coast would be silently ringed with mines and submarines would be waiting for every battleship. <laughs> and, and all that would have sent a frisson down the spine of British readers at the time. And it's it's actually quite hard for us to understand a century later when the reasons for the First World War have been so clouded by subsequent debate, whether yeah. the war arose out of deliberate plots or was simply a muddle um, that, that ran out of control has been discussed ever since. What we get in the 39 Steps is very much of its time. And I think that's true of Buchan's language in the book, or rather more accurately, Hannay's. We can't ignore the fact that as a result of the 39 Steps, Buchan has a reputation in some quarters as an anti-Semitic writer. But he is actually completely undeserved. Right at the start of the story, the fictional character Scudder says that the evil forces that he's been tracking are part of a Jewish stroke anarchist conspiracy, and he really doesn't mince his words. But, and it is an important but, the mad freelance spy has got it all wrong, as Hanny discovers when he finally deciphers the notebook. He says, The little man had told me a pack of lies. All his yarns about the Balkans and the Jew anarchists were eyewash. And Sir Walter Bullivan to the Foreign Office, to whom Hannay eventually reports, says he wouldn't use Scudder as a spy because he knows his judgment is skewed, since he has this weird obsession about a Jewish conspiracy. Yeah, yeah. So, so der Schwarze Stein, the Black Stone, turns out to be Prussians. After all, Buckham was actually a philo-Semite, someone with an interest in, respect for, an appreciation of the yeah. Jewish people and their history, and not an anti-Semite at all. That's, that's right. But we'll explore further in another episode. We'll come on to that again. Michael, uh, we're, we're coming towards the end, so perhaps you could sum up for our listeners, why you think The 39 Steps is actually, in, in, in a funny sort of way, an important book. Uh, I could do that, perhaps, by quoting again, finally, from the novel. Close to the end, Hannay knocks on the door of a villa on the cliff top in Bradgate, which we mentioned earlier, thinking dark thoughts as he waits for the maid to open the door. This is what he says. A man of my sort who's travelled about the world in rough places, gets on perfectly well with two classes, what you may call the upper and the lower. He understands them, and they understand him. I was at home with herds and tramps and roadmen, and I was sufficiently at ease with people like Sir Walter. I can't explain why, but it's a fact. But what fellows like me don't understand is the great, comfortable, satisfied, middle-class world, the folk who live in villas and suburbs. He doesn't know how they look at things, he doesn't understand their conventions, and he is as shy of them as of a black mamba. When a trim parlour maid opened the door, I could hardly find my voice. I, I, love, I love the idea of being as shy of them as a black mamba, I must yes. say. Yes. <laughs> Buchan is, in a way, I think, putting us on notice here that his take on the world will be unconventional. This is as true of the other Hannay novels we'll be looking at 
as of the 39 steps. He is writing for a middle-class reader, but in a, an unusual voice. In his thrillers, the plain man will play a great part, and it's through the plain man's view of a turbulent world that it will be made sense of. And this is about as far from snobbery with violence, the way Buchan's writing was characterised in the 60s play 40 years on, as it's possible to get, surely. Yeah, apart, apart from anything else, there's so very little violence perpetrated by Hanny in the novels. Occasionally he throws a reluctant punch when he can't avoid it, but that's about all. Quite. As much as through its innovations as a thriller, important though they were, it was through its social sympathies that the 39 Steps became the prototype of new forms of fiction. And Buchan's influence was readily acknowledged in this way by writers as varied as Graham Greene, Ian Fleming, Eric Ambler and John le Carre. Yeah, I think The 39 Steps also shows the way that Buchan meant to go on. He's stuck at home, he's feeling underemployed as his friends went off to war, he's worried about what was going to happen to Thomas Nelson during the war, dreading the conflagration that he knew would come. For he actually, he was a great student of the American Civil War, which was the first really mechanised war, and he knew this one was going to be even worse. And he wanted to play his patriotic part. And that part consisted of engaging with official propaganda work, alongside which he could write more exciting thrillers, which would enlighten those who had eyes to see and entertain everybody else, including himself. He absolutely <laughs> loved writing those thrillers. He really uh, enjoyed it. They were uh, a great uh, recreation to him. And I think we'll see more of this when we tackle the second Hannay book, Green Mantle, which is our next episode of John Buchan Unbound. So until then, goodbye. Thank you so much for listening. Goodbye. <laughs>